today we're going to talk about Avalon Hills The Dark Emperor, the game of Fantastic Warfare from 1985. It's one of their, their bookshelf games. It looks like a very interesting and probably unique game, so I'm looking forward to getting in there. First of all, the art is very well done. Definitely presents a theme of, you know, literally, I guess, darkness. A lot of detail on the armor. Especially impressive since these are, you know, I guess you'd call them analog paintings and they weren't, you know, dig digitalized back in the day. So, unique piece of art. Kind of sends you into the mystery of what's going to go on here. You see a lot of ruin and you see kind of nasty looking emperor here with some nasty weapons. So, kind of curious where this is going to go. It very well presents the theme in the back. So I'll give you a snapshot here. Bloody death is at hand. In the third age of magic, a bloody war was fought against a great necromancer, Pedrick Darishong, bane of all that lives. As a result, he was banished to the realm of the dead by the Poissant Emperor Padram III. Defeated but not destroyed, Pedrick brooded for centuries in the cold and silent fields of decay and gathered eldritch forces to bring death into the lands of men. As the centuries passed, his power drew Talmorn, Lord of Vampires, and Mazal, avatar of the goddess Sanbu, to his cause. Now with the human kingdoms divided, his time has come. Utilizing ancient forbidden rites, Padrak has returned at the head of vampiric legions. Backed by the infinite might of death and the power that lies within terror, he is again prepared to teach the peoples of Zlaslan to fear the power that is death. It's a fantasy war game for two players. It's in the unique world of Laslan. It's a divided but formidable human kingdoms against his small but powerful forces of Padrak Darshalm. It's interesting they got like front sounding names. Play two four hours, complexity and six on scale down. So it's very intriguing. It does have some good background to really flesh out the game. So the rules it also talk, it talks about the get some insight into the different places and persons of the world of the Lost Lawn. It's all a horror eslore. The imperial tongues are also horror means old high empire. To the third age of magic, this empire will the entire game map and some lands beyond. It's all a horror eslore. Remains the single strongest power. Its court life is a labyrinthine web of deadly intrigue. Sounds like kind of a Byzantine empire. Ahat Syrian. To the height of the empire and to this day, this area has been heavily mined. It is renowned for the quality of its metals. Its economy is dependent on mining and metalworking. Furlory. When the south was overrun by the Stavic barbarians and it became clear that the empire could not aid them, Furlary declared its independence and built a sizable fleet to protect its, its far-flung dominions. Kelrin Oret. For its size, Kelrin is one of the world's most productive nations, though it maintains a small military. Oret in the tongue of Kelrin means low rule, which means republic. The Maraks, the two Marak kingdom, Lenmark. Eastern Marak and Loimarak, Western Marak. Loimarak is noted for its formidable cavalry and excellent horses. Starkeep. Starkeep is of great religious importance to the lands around it. Because of this, it has never had to face a major invasion, but they maintain a small armed force just in case. Stavor. The throne of Stavor is often usurped by the military, creating continual distrust between the king and his generals. As a result, the military, though large, is undertrained, ill-equipped, and poorly funded. Toplator, the house of Plet Pletrek, the royal house of Toplator, for the last 600 years, was overthrown 12 years ago, kind of recent times, by Stamaran. Since the coup, he has formed the King's Guard, who, unlike the regular army, are fanatically loyal to his person. These units are trained to suppress the local population and have little traditional military training, hence their lower combat strengths. Lord Montai, 
the lands between the cities of Montoy and the gates here conquered ten years ago by Stavor, Lord Montoy was a ruler. There's more detail to these, I'm just kind of capturing highlights. And then some of the prominent personality and weapons. Sar is an intelligent great eagle from the mountains Ahasuran, from the pronunciation. Fernand Kober was born in Kalanorat. He was banished from this land when it was discovered that he bribed his way into Ahobat. He has become a mercenary leader of considerable ability. Considerable ability. The Hounds. The Hounds are a race of canine sapiens who live in the far north. Marfoloi, a human, was abandoned in the land as a child. They adopted him and raised him to the to the pack. Kos Kolkos is a member of the Cult of Unity, a religious cult who believe that magic was brought has brought man nothing but misery. They seek to eliminate magic from Moslan and return to the ancient ways. Silver Flugreel is the founder of the cult of Burning Inspiration. This cult is associated with the Fire Rune. It believes that evil must be burned out wherever it is found. It is an intolerant cult who perceive evil rampant in their world. Some special items highlighted here. The Sword Famir was forged by Felric Turiel during the Third Age of Magic. It is an extremely powerful weapon, one of the few capable of permanently destroying a lord of death such as Talmorn or Padrek Darshoim. He soups on Prana. This sword was forged by a metal mage, enslaved by Padras del Shom, before he was driven from, from the land of the living. When it strikes an enemy, the sword drains his soul and destroys him. The silk negator, this item was woven by the cult of unity, is a cloth with the ability to negate any magic. And there'll be other magic items as well. So the rule book, it's uh, 16 pages, including got some player aids on the back. And it's a three color, um, blue, black and white. Got some nice art inside as well. Other components, comes with a couple six sided dice. The cup Yaga didn't have the dice, so I'm using dice from another Avalon Hill game. Good mix of counters, 260 of them. The game does have some um, mounted boards, so to it doesn't come with a tray. So to have a tray that fits in a box, you'll need kind of a thinner tray, and it's just like a craft one I got. About half the counters are unique, shown here. You have various kind of military counters, you got some magic items, you have leader description, you have battle field descriptions. And all the a lot of the units have live, you know, a live and then an undead side to them, as you'll see here. Combat units are differentiated in terms of combat strength, which is shown on here. And then also they differentiate by the the nation force by color coding here. So a necromancer would be a gray square and no circle. Battlefield would be gray and white. Tall Platora would be gray square and yellow circle. A Zella Hustler would be purple with no circle. Stavor would be green and orange. The Scythe would be green and white. Starkeep would be red and green. Coloran Orit would be red and yellow. Falori would be blue and white. Ahalsturin would be would be blue and yellow. Lamarack would be brown and orange. Lamarack would be brown and yellow. Costo cost would be just a yellow circle. Lord Montoya be just red. Fernand Conover would be just a green circle. Silver Flugreel would be just an orange circle. Sar 
would just be a blue circle. Houndmaster would be just purple circle. So it's the color coding. And you can see several of them. So for instance, we these would be Legion forces. These are infantry units, various combat strengths. And not all the the nations have the different forces you see. Siege engines, cavalry units, there's air units, which includes the greater vampire units, lesser vampire units, Sarlamen, rock riders, and again, some of these have an undead side and then some don't. And then there's the hound. As far as leaders, they have the nomenclature of you know, the hero rating, the magic rune, and the magic strength. Heroes are, leaders are shown over here, Pedrick, Josham, Samrak, Selfran, Padran, Ploy, Ludvillam, Skydor, Kebler, White Hand, Lord Montoe, Tolmor, Silver Flagrail, Normoran, Glipnud, Tasash, Stav Floran, Farnan, Sar, Mazal, Fernan Kofner, Furlor, Zelroy de Fenori, the Keeper, Nikon 5, Cost of Cost, Master. There's different battlefield markers which we'll discuss in rules what these mean. Naval units, again with combat strengths and living and undead, different you know, nationalities. Other indicators include the Living Sword Hero Sword, Flame Marker, Trenches, and there's magical devices and monsters. Some of these have the this indicator on one side and then what they are on the other and some you just see what they are without the other the side. Some magical devices we have are the Swarf and Fenir, Hesops and Prana. And then here we so it's the hero rating, the magic rune and magic strength. Keeper Scepter, Staff of Empire, Staff of Waters. The Sword, the Swan, the Torch of Liberty. Monsters, we have Stroth and Serex. You know, Avalon always does a great job on its maps. It's uh, board mounted and it uh, comes in two individual sections that each have four sections in them. And it's, I uh, guess, people. And they do a great job on terrain. And we talked about the regions earlier, but there's also you know cities in here too. And uh, rune indicators. Special map one hex equals 100 imperial zots. <clears throat> and then here there's a, so there's a terrain key, which is nice. So cities, mountains, rivers, seas. Ports, holy places, settled, magic hexes, which are indicated by this, battlefields are indicated here, borders are the red, and then capital cities. And then over here we have a keep the record track, rune indicators, you know, leader boxes, you need treasury tracking over here as well. Mercenary holding boxes and then arming holding boxes. It's about uh, it's 32 by 22 about, so very well done. Then we'll get into rules. Look at the rules here. First credits, design development, Greg Kostikian. Hopefully got the pronunciation right this time. Editing, layout. Richard Snyder, acknowledgments, illustration, cover, Jim Talbot, sequence of play, Dark Emperor is playing game turns, each game turn is divided into two player turns, 
one for the Necromancer and the other for the Kingdoms. In all game turns, the Necromancer has the first player turn. Turn sequence outline. Necromancer player turn, recruitment phase, vampire recruitment phase, bring lesser and greater vampire units into play if the total number of such units in play is less than the current vampire army maximum. Kingdom taxation segment, kingdoms allied to the necromancer collect taxes. Kingdom recruitment segment, kingdoms allied to the necromancer recruit units from their recruitment pools. Two movement phase, magic segment, the necromancer's leaders can cast spells affecting movement. Movement segment, the necromancer moves his units and leaders. Attrition segment, the necromancer resolves attrition for units that moved. Three combat phase, magic segment, the necromancer's leaders may cast spells affecting combat. Combat resolution segment, resolve attacks by necromancer's units. Undead recruitment segment, units eliminated. In 3B, in battlefield units may be recruited as undead units by death rune leaders. Stacking judgment segment. If any necromancer's stack has more units than the stacking rules permit, he must eliminate the excess units. Diplomacy phase, magic segment. Necromancer's leaders may cast spells affecting diplomacy. Diplomacy resolution segment. The necromancer may attempt to sway neutral mercenaries and kingdoms to his cause. Heroic combat segment. Heroic combat between monsters and leaders is resolved. And then the kingdom player turn. Recruitment phase. Taxation segment. Activated kingdoms may collect taxes. Recruitment segment. The kingdoms may recruit units from their recruitment pools. Clarine Orient election segment. Odd, num odd number turns only. The kingdom's player rolls on the Clarion or yet election table, 2, 3, and 4 is specified for the Necromancer player turn, except the King of Players performs all actions specified. So that's movement, combat, diplomacy. 5, game turn, record segment. At the end of 14 turns, the game ends and the players determine the winner. Activation and Conquest. Activation. At the beginning of the game, none of the kingdoms are at war with the necromancer. Consequently, the kingdom player controls no units or leaders. He only gains control of the kingdom if it is activated. In the course of play, the various kingdoms can come under the control of either player. When the kingdom moves under the control of either player, it is said to be activated. If a unit of either player enters or moves through any land hex of an inactive kingdom, the kingdom is activated, immediately coming under the control of the other player. Movement by a naval or air unit into coastal hex with land, unit will activate a nation. Movements across the sea border with no land in the hex does not activate, does not cause activation. Recruiting a monster in a hex owned by an inactive kingdom or using any diplomatic spell activates that kingdom under the control of the opposing player. Kingdoms can be activated in either player's favor through diplomacy. Salu Har Eslor Automatically activates in favor of the kingdom's player at the start of game turn 10, if it has not already been activated. If any unit, leader, or monster controlled by the necromancer enters any holy place hex, Starkeep activates in favor of the kingdom player. Leaders' magical devices may move through inactive kingdoms without activating them. At any time, the necromancer can announce that he is betraying one of the kingdoms under his control. When this occurs, the kingdom immediately comes under the control of the kingdom's player. Effects of activation. Kingdom can do nothing if it until it is activated. An activation, the kingdom comes under the control of one of the players. Kingdoms that are betrayed by a necromancer may have two player turns on the same game turn, one while under the control of the necromancer and another while controlled by the kingdoms. Conquest, a kingdom is conquered if at the end of any friendly player turn all its cities are occupied by enemy units. When a kingdom is conquered, it loses the ability to collect taxes and raids units. Cold in the kingdom's treasury at the time of conquest is retained by the conquered kingdom, and its units and leaders may continue to move, engage in combat, conduct diplomacy, etc. A kingdom that has not been conquered controls all its sexes and cities within its boundaries, and, except those occupied or controlled by enemy units. The conquered kingdom only controls sexes that are occupied or controlled by friendly, friendly units. When, his king, when a kingdom is conquered, the conquering player must assign control of it to other kingdoms under his control. If the necromancer is the conquering player, 
you may assign control to a necromancer. Once assigned, this control may not be transferred to another kingdom except by reconquest of the area. If all cities of a conquered kingdom are occupied by friendly units at the end of a enemy player turn, the kingdom is reconquered. It may either be assigned to a friend of the kingdom or the necromancer or returned to the control of its original owner. In the latter case, the kingdom regains the ability to collect taxes and raise units. In the prior case, it does not. Recruitment phase, taxation. Trend taxation segment activated kingdoms controlled by the phasing player collect taxes. Each subtle hex, river hex, or city controlled by kingdom produces taxes for it. Units exert a zone of control in the hex they are in, and all six J's in hexes. They do not exert a zone of control into hexes they cannot enter. For taxation purposes, kingdom controls all hexes within the zone of control of its units, and all hexes in its kingdom not controlled by enemy units. The kingdom's units never control hexes belonging to allied or inactive kingdoms. A unit controls the hexes and for taxation purposes. If both enemy and friendly zones of control extend, into any other taxable hex, neither is allowed to tax it. Each settled river hex produces two gold units per taxation segment. Non-river settled hexes produce one gold unit. Each city produces one gold unit per point of its city value. Cities do not produce revenue unless they are occupied by friendly units. The taxation value of each kingdom is printed next to its name in the game map. If the kingdom cities are occupied by friendly units and no enemy units controlling hexes in it, Kingdom produces this number of gold units in the taxation segment. If some hexes are enemy controlled, the taxation value can be determined by subtracting the value of the enemy controlled mutually controlled hexes from the gross taxation table. In the taxation segment, calculate the revenue received by each kingdom controlled by the phasing player. Kingdoms controlled by the necromancer do not produce revenue. Recruitment. During the recruitment segment, kingdoms controlled by the phasing player can recruit units. Each kingdom's starting recruitment pool consists of all the units that do not begin play in the game map. Units lost through combat, attrition, or in other ways are added to this pool as the game progresses. Important, under some circumstances, eliminated units are permanently remo removed from the game. Units that are eliminated for in combat and then raised as undead units by a death room leader remain in play as undead units under the control of the raising player. If undead units are eliminated, they are removed from play. Units can also be permanently eliminated by banish undead spell and certain magical devices. A kingdom can recruit any or all units in its recruitment pool. The cost to recruit a unit is a set amount of gold, depending on its type. If a kingdom cannot afford to recruit all the units it wishes to recruit, Allied kingdoms may, at the phasing player's discretion, give gold to the recruiting kingdom. To do so, cost the transferring kingdom twice as much gold as the recruiting kingdom receives. Recruited units appear in any city in the recruiting kingdom of the player's choice. They cannot be recruited outside of their home kingdom, even in assigned conquered kingdoms. Naval units may only be recruited in ports. No unit can be recruited in a city controlled by enemy units unless it is occupied by friendly units. Only as many units as the city value may be recruited in a city in one recruitment phase. Vampire recruitment. During this segment, the necromancer may recruit vampire units. Only the necromancer can only recruit new vampire units if he controls a large enough population to support them. In a taxation segment, the necromancer player determines the taxation value of all hexes controlled by a necromancer, vampire and end units. This number is divided by 5 with all fractions dropped. The result is a maximum number of vampire units that can be in play. If the maximum vampire army size is lower than the number of vampire units in play, no vampire units are eliminated and none may be recruited. If the maximum vampire army size is greater than the number of vampire units in play, new vampire units can be recruited to bring the number of vampire units up to the maximum vampire army size. Vampire units can only be recruited in city hexes occupied by an existing vampire unit. Each vampire unit in a city hex can recruit one new vampire unit, as long as the maximum vampire armor size is not exceeded. Vampire units cannot be recruited in a city if there are enemy units in an adjacent hex. Vampire units have a recruitment pool. Initially, this consists of the lesser vampire units. Eliminated vampires are, are returned to this pool, and when vampire units are recruited, can be raised by the necromancer. Greater vampire units may be permanently eliminated. 
They are permanently eliminated if a banished undead spell is successfully cast against them, or if they are eliminated in combat by a force whose leader bears the sword Lawslon, the sword Fam Famir, or a living sword. Lesser vampire units cannot be permanently eliminated. The Necromancer begins play with the Siege Train. If it is eliminated, it cannot be rebuilt. Movement and Attrition. During the movement phase, a phasing player can move any or all of his units. As a stack of unit moves, it accrues attrition points. During the attrition segment, the phasing player rolls for each stack he moved to determine how many units in that stack are lost to attrition. There are five types of units, infantry, cavalry, arm, air, siege, train, and naval. When a stack of units enters a hex, it accrues attrition points. The number of points accrued depends on the type of unit and the type of train it entered. Where a stack contains different types of units, it accrues the maximum number of attrition points possible for each hex it enters. The only exception to this rule is naval movement. After moving each stack, determine how many attrition points is accrued. Find this number at the top of the attrition table and roll one die. Cross-referencing the roll with the number of attrition points. The result is the number of units that are lost in the move. Phasing player will determine which units to lose. Units may enter and move through hexes containing enemy units. When a stack moves through such hex, it grows attrition points equal to the total combat strength of the enemy units plus the attrition cost of the train. If a stack enters the hex and stops, only the train point cost is accrued. Land units, infantry, cavalry, and siege train may not move across all seed hex sides. Naval units may not move across all end hex sides. They're not crossed by a river. Air units may cross any hex side. Leaders do not suffer attrition. They can cross any hex side. Since they are assumed to be able to commandeer small craft to move across water, effectively a leader can move from any place on the map to any other place. Leaders may not move through hexes containing enemy units unless they are accompanied by friendly units. They can move through hexes that contain inactive units. If a leader enters a magic hex containing a face down magic hex counter, he must immediately stop his movement and remain in that hex. Naval movement. Naval units can enter can only enter all sea, coastal, or river hexes. They may only enter land hexes by moving along a river that is in that hex. If a naval unit begins to move in a port city containing infantry, cavalry, or siege train unit, he may embark that unit. The land unit then moves with the naval unit and can cross all sea hex sides. Each naval unit can carry one land unit, regardless of type. When attrition is determined, it is accrued as if only naval units were in the attack in the stack. Land units may only be embarked at the beginning of the movement segment. Naval units may disembark a land unit at any time in any coastal hex. If the naval unit continues moving, the land units become a separate stack for attrition. If they end movement in the same hex, they remain a single stack for attrition. Disembarked land units may not move in the phase that they are disembarked by a naval unit. Naval units may end their move in all sea hexes. If a river hex or coastal hex is occupied by an enemy naval unit, friendly land units may move into the hex but may not move through it unless a friendly naval unit is present. Land units must end their movement when they enter such a hex. Air and vampire units. Air units may cross any hex side. They must end their movement in a land hex. Vampire units may enter but cannot move through hexes containing rivers. Vampires cannot cross running water. You must stop movement on entering such a hex, but could continue moving in any direction on the next turn. Vampire units are not affected by sea hexes in any way. They must end their movement in the land hex. Leader boxes. Leader boxes are located in the game board. Units that are stacked with a leader can be placed in this box. Combat. If the beginning of the combat resolution segment, units of opposing players are in the same hex, combat must occur. All combat is a result on a hex by hex basis. Com the phasing player determines the order in which battles are resolved. For combat, the phasing player is the attacker, the other player is the defender. All units may engage in combat with all other units, regardless of unit type. Land units embarked in naval units do le lend their strength if those land naval units are involved in combat, even if combat occurs in all sea hucks. Combat resolution. Compare the total combat strength of the attacker with that of the defender. Divide the greater number by the lesser. Round the result down if the attacker is stronger. Round it up if the defender is stronger. Subtract one from the number. Roll die if the attacker is stronger. Add the number determined above to your roll. If the defender is stronger, subtract that number from the roll. Each leader has a hero rating. If the attacker 
has a leader present, he has the leaders here rating the role. If the defender has a leader, he subtracts the leader's hero rating. Only one leader may use his hero rating in a given combat for each side. If combat occurs in a mountain hex, subtract two from the die roll. Refer to the combat results table. Find the modified die roll on the left side of the table. Read across to the columns. Label attacker and defender. Apply the results in the attacker column to the attacker and the defender column to the defender. If the listed number result is dashed, the player suffers no loss. If it is a number, that number of units of the affected player's choice are lost. Sometimes the combat result contains the letter R with a number. In this case, the force loses the number of units indicated and must retreat to the adjacent hex or hexes. Retreating units may now retreat into hexes that are impassable for them. They may not enter hexes that are occupied by enemy units. They may not retreat into hexes that enemy units entered the battle hex through unless they have no other option. Finally, they cannot retreat across the borders of inactive kingdoms. In all cases, units that cannot retreat obeying these rules are eliminated. If units are forced to retreat, friendly leaders and devices retreat with them. If the friendly leaders are left without any friendly units, if combat is resolved, they can be eliminated if the hex contains any enemy units. Roll die for each leader. If the roll is less than or equal to his hero rating, he escapes and can be placed in any hex on the game map that does not contain enemy units, taking his devices, taking any devices that he has with him. If the roll is higher than the hero rating, he is permanently re removed from play. If devices are left alone in a hex with enemy units, they are captured and can be used by the enemy player. Sieges and siege trains. All units defending in a city have their combat strength doubled. Defenders of a city are not doubled against attacking units who have a siege train. Siege train units may never be eliminated in combat. They can be lost to attrition spells. If all their friendly units with a siege train are lost, or hex only contains a siege train and is entered by enemy units, the siege train is captured and can be used by the enemy as if it was its own. If the captured siege train is eliminated, it is returned to the recruitment pool of its original owner. Unless it's the necromancer, unless it's the necromancer's original C train, in other ways, C trains function as normal units. Stacking each hex has stacking limit is indicated in the train flex chart. The limit for settled and all C hexes is four. For mountain hexes, it is two. If a hex contains a city, the stacking limit is increased by the city value of that city. Stacking comes into play during the stacking judgment segment of the friendly combat phase. At all other times during a turn, units can be overstacked. During the stacking judgment segment, the phasing player must examine stacks. If a stack contains more units than the hex allows, the excess units are eliminated. The phasing player chooses which site which units to lose. Only the phasing player loses units during the stacking judgment segment. The other player is unaffected until his turn comes around. Diplomacy. Leaders may travel through any hex or hexes except those containing enemy units and magic hexes. If a player wants to conduct diplomacy with an inactive kingdom, he must move one of his leaders to that kingdom's capital during his move phase. During his diplomacy phase, friendly leaders in the capital cities of inactive kingdoms can conduct diplomacy. Only one diplomacy attempt can be made with a given kingdom in a given phase, no matter how many friendly leaders are present. Refer to the diplomacy table, find the name of the kingdom in the left. Hand column, read over to the column headed by the player making an attempt. You'll find either a positive or negative number in this column. This number added to the roll of the dice is the result of your diplomacy attempt. If the result is 10 or higher, the kingdom activates in favor of the phasing player. If it is lost, the kingdom remains inactive. Note diplomacy is conducted with mercenaries and monsters using the same using the procedure above. Magic. Some leaders use magic. Those who do have a magic rune and magic strength in the colors. The ten magic runes are Death, Terror, Earth, Fire, Metal, Life, Serenity, Air, Water, Wood. The magic rune of a leader determines the type of magic that he can use. I.e. if the, his rune is terror, he may only cast the magic of terror unless the artifact allows him to cast a second type as well. When you cast magic, there are three types. There are three magic segments in each player turn. They are in the movement, combat, and diplomacy phases. Each spell in, in this game is either 
a movement, combat, or a diplomacy spell. Spells may only be cast in the appropriate phase. Combat spells can be cast by both the attacker and the defender. Movement and diplomacy spells may only be cast by the phasing player. Counter spells are a special category. They can be cast in any magic segment of the opposing player's player turn or in the friendly combat magic segment. Magic Strength. The leader's magic strength is the rightmost mark on the counter. When a leader casts a spell, the player rolls a die. If the roll is less than or equal to the leader's magic strength, the spell takes effect. If not, it has no effect. Leaders may cast more than one spell in the game turn. The second time he casts, he cast, his magic strength is reduced to one. The third time is reduced to etc. When his strength is reduced to zero, he may not cast any more spells in that game turn. The magic strength of all leaders returns to its full value at the start of each game turn. Rune symbols. Certain hexes and mag contain rune symbols. If a leader with the same magic rune becomes begins the game turn in such a hex, his magic strength is increased by one for that game turn. Each rune is opposed to one other rune. In 12, the runes directly across from each other are opposed. So these are the opposing ones. Proposition 6. Leaders may cast counter spells for spells of the opposing rune. A terror rune leader may cast counter spells against surrounding spells. To cast counter spell, a friendly leader of the opposite rune must be in the same hex as an enemy who is casting opposing magic. For counter spells, the enemy player must first roll to see if his spell succeeds. If it does, the friendly player can cast his counter spell. If the counter spell succeeds, the enemy spell is negated. If it fails, the enemy spell has its full effect. Counter spells may not be countered by any other spell. If one attempt to cast a spell fails, the caster may immediately attempt to cast again using his Lord Magic Strength. The same spell may be cast in succession in the same segment if so desired. In the combat magic segment, banish undead spells take effect after all their spells. Kill spells take effect after, before banish undead, but after all their spells. The effects of the spells are described in the following sections. Elemental runes, fire, wall of flames. It's a movement spell. Any or all the hexes adjacent to the caster become impossible until the caster is next friendly. Magic movement segment. Place flames marker in the hex. It's used to effect. And any may use these hexes are unable to move until the flames are removed. Incinerate. Combat. The caster may choose one enemy unit in this hex to eliminate. He may not choose enemy leaders. Counter water. And then water. Part C movement. The caster and any units with him can move through all C hexes if they were settled hexes. Naval units may still move with a stock. Maelstrom, combat spell. After any two naval units in the caster's hex are limited by success, he may choose which to remove. If either is carrying land units, they are also eliminated. If only one enemy naval unit is present, only it is eliminated. Then counter far spell. Air, call wind, movement. Attrition costs for naval units moving through the, with the caster reduced to 50% rounded down for this game turn. Fly, movement, all units moving with a caster, pay air, attrition cost. The spell may not be used to make naval units fly. It will affect siege trains. And then counter earth, earth, move earth, combat spell. One of three possible effects of the caster's choice occurs. One, creating entrenchments in the caster's hex, giving the hex the defensive value of the city. With the city value of zero, place an entrenchment marker in the hex. Remove entrenchments. If there is an entrenchment parker, if there is an entrenchment counter in the hex is removed, create breaches. If the hex contains a city, its defenders are not doubled for this game turn due to the effects of the spell. Open charm, an enemy land unit in the caster's hex. The caster's choice is eliminated. It may not be a leader unit, then counter error, and then metal. For the sword movement, Place either a living sword or a hero sword in the caster's hex. The caster may choose which to ch create. Encounter wood, wood, movement, build fleet, and the fourth sword is movement. So build fleet. Success can create a number of fleets equal to the caster's roll when rolling for a spell success. If the caster rolls two, 
That's two fleets. Any fleets created appear in the caster's hex. Caster may create fewer fleets if he desires. Place neutral white fleets to mark those he creates. Other runes. Death. Kill. Combat spell. When enemy leader in the caster's hex is targeted, he's eliminated unless his player makes a successful roll against his hero rating or magic strength, whichever is higher. If the roll is less than or equal to the higher value, the leader lives. If not, he's dead. Raise undead. Undead recruitment. This spell is cast in the undead recruitment segment to either combat phase. It cannot be cast if the caster was forced to retreat. In the immediately preceding combat resolution segment, if the spell succeeds, all units eliminated during the combat resolution segment are flipped to their undead side and return to play under the control of the casting player. Vampire units and the units of the cost to cost are being dispelled. Eliminated undead units are permanently removed from play and cannot be reintroduced with a spell. This spell can be used to turn battlefield units into undead units. Battlefield units are those that begin face down in battlefield hex. Success brings all these units as battlefield owners control the caster as undead units. And then counter life spell. Life, banish undead, combat spell. The caster chooses one of the following effects. Eliminate all undead units in the caster's hex. Eliminate all lesser vampire units in the caster's hex. Permanently eliminate one greater vampire in the caster's hex. Temporarily eliminate Tall Morn. C16, if he fails to roll less than or equal to his hero rating, he must be in the caster's hex to be affected. Raised from the dead movement. One dead leader may be returned to play in the caster's hex. But spelled to work, the leader must have died in the current. Previous game turn in the caster must be in the hex in which the leader is killed. No leader can be raised more than once. Counter death. And then terror. Fear. It's a combat spell. An enemy unit, the caster's choice, must retreat from the hex. If it cannot, it is eliminated. Intimidation. Diplomacy spell. Add one to the roll when the caster conducts diplomacy. If the spell is cast from the once in the same segment, the effect is additive. Counter serenity. Serenity spells, peace is a combat spell. One enemy unit of the caster's choice must retreat before combat. Greater vampire units are affected by a spell that cannot be forced to retreat. Sweet reason, diplomacy. Add two to the diplomacy die roll. As with determination, multiple success in the game in the same segment has an effect and then counter terror. Magical devices. Magical devices include items that begin as magic hex out counters. Those that those that begin in possession of various leaders and those created by a metal ruin leader. General rules. Many devices have hero ratings, magic runes, and or magic strengths. A device with a hero rating adds its rating to the, mid the hero rating of any leader who carries it. If a leader carries a magic rune device and he has the same magic rune himself, his magic strength is increased by the magic strength of the device. I.e., if a four strength death leader with a hero rating of two carries a he hoops on prana, one strength death item, his effective magic strength when he uses it is five, and his hero rating is three. If he uses a different rune or no rune, he may cast the device's magic at its magic strength. No leader may ever use a device of an opposing rune. Note. Or the ability to cast more than one type of magic is gained from items. Magic strength is reduced independently when the powers are used. I.e. a leader has an item of with a two strength air rune and a three strength metal rune leader. If he casts flight, the air power is reduced by one, and his metal power is unaffected, remaining at three. A leader can carry any number of devices. They stay with him wherever he travels. If he is killed, they are captured by his slayers. During the movement, he may transfer any of his devices to any friendly or neutral leader. A device transferred to a neutral leader cannot be retrieved until his kingdom is activated. A given leader may use a given leader may only use two devices in a given game turn. Using a device is defined as increasing the hero rating, increasing the magic strength under casting spells, and or using any of his device's special abilities. Of the two devices used, only one can be a sword. Swords are hero swords, living swords, the sword, Famir, the sword of Lost Lam, and he sops on Prano. Devices can be left with a stack of friendly units, though only leaders can use them. Such a device can be picked up by a leader during movement. If a stack guarding a device is eliminated, the device is captured. The magic strength of a device is increased by one if it begins the owning player's 
moving phase in a rune hex of its rune. If a device carrying mage with the same rune is in the same is in such a hex, its strength is effectively increased by two. Certain devices have special powers in addition to or instead of their ability to increase the hero rating of a leader or lend him magical strength. These items are described in the sections that follow. Living Swords, Lostlom, and Famir. If a leader uses these blades in combat, any greater vampire unit killed by his side is permanently eliminated. They do not return to the Necromancer's recruitment pool. If Tal Morn and Ord Padrich Del Sharing are killed, an enemy leader vaulted the Sword Lassam or the Sword from Mir in the battle, they are permanently killed. The Sword from Mir has additional powers. He steps on Prana. If a Death Room leader has, uses his blade, any living units are killed by units under his control are permanently eliminated unless they are raised as undead. This does not apply to vampire and undead units. The Dawn Lantern, if leader using the same is present, the combat strength of all vampire units in the battle are reduced by one each. Silk Negator, when a leader carries this unit, the owning player must state at the beginning of each magic segment whether he's using it. If he does, no magic of any kind can be used by any leader in that hex. If it is used in combat magic segment, the Raise Undead spell cannot be used in the subsequent Undead Recruitment segment. This item influences cast spells. It does not affect magical devices. The Torch of Liberty. Every odd game turn, the Kingdom player rolls one on the rolls on the Kaleran Arit election table to determine who the new Doge is. After this, the Torch of Liberty teleports to the leader's hex. If the rain Doge is killed, the new Doge the new Doge is elected and the torch teleports to him. If all Kalron leaders are slain, the torch teleports off the map and is permanently removed from play. The Staff of Empire. If a Staff Holder is present in a hex containing undead Imperial Legion units, he can take command of those legions. The owning player of the, of the Welder the owning player of the Welder can use the undead legionaries as his own as long as the Staff Holder stays with them. The staff has full effect on the four battlefield units labeled as Imperial Legions 3, 5, 10, and 12. The Necromancer and Telmorn. These leaders, unlike all others, are not dead when they die. If either is killed, he returns to play two game turns after his death during the Necromancer's recruitment phase. These leaders are permanently killed if they fall in a battle where the Sword Lost Lawn or the Sword Famir is used. Killer and Orit Elections. During the Keller and Orit election segment of his recruitment phase, odd game turns only. The games player must roll in the election table to determine which Keller and leader is the new Doge. The only effect of the election is to move the Torch of Liberty to the new Doge. It may not be used by anyone except the Doge, and may not be transferred. Magic Hex Markers, seven Magic Hexes, printed with pentacles, are on the game map. At the end of the game, place the magic hex marker in each of these hexes with its pinnacle side showing. Neither player may look at the reverse side until he enters the hex. General rules. During the friendly movement segment, the phasing player can move any of his leaders to a magic hex with an unrevealed magic hex marker. Any leader moved to a hex must stop movement to remain there. At the end of the diplo diplomacy resolution segment, the magic hex marker in any hex that contains the leader is revealed. If it is a magical device, the leader picks it up and can use it. If the device is Famir, see following rules. If it is a Sothoth, the Dragon Syrex, or the Slug, the leader must either con conduct diplomacy with a monster or engage in it in heroic combat. It is option. The diplomacy table lists modifiers for each monster. Determine the modifier that applies to the leader's player. Roll two dice and a Play the modifier. If the modified roll is greater than or equal to 10, the monster comes under the phasing player's control. If not, the leader must engage the monster, monster in heroic combat. If the diplomacy attempt succeeds, see the following. Heroic combat. Refer to the heroic combat table. Find the name of the monster at the top of the table and the modified hero rating of the attacking leader on the left side. Cross reference and roll a die. If the roll is less than or equal to the number that the leader kills the monster, it is removed from play. And the leader's hero rating is permanently increased by one. If the roll is greater than the listed number, the monster eats the leader. The leader is removed from play, and the monster remains in the hex. Whenever diplomacy fails, the leader must engage in heroic combat. If 
If more than one friendly leader occupies a monster attacks and diplomacy fails, the player must choose one to engage in heroic combat. This leader dies, the next leader must also engage in heroic combat. This continues until the monster is killed or all friendly leaders and hacks are dead. Monsters. Monsters do not suffer from attrition, may move as leaders do. If a monster enters an inactive kingdom, the kingdom is activated as if an enemy unit had entered it. If a leader gains control of a monster in an inactive kingdom, the kingdom is activated under the control of the opposing player. Monsters do not have hero ratings. They are treated as units in combat. Monsters cannot be affected by spells of any kind. The controller of a monster may only eliminate it if all other friendly units in the hex have been eliminated. The dragon's rocks has a fire rune and a magical strength. It can cast fire spells as if it were a fire rune leader. Soth, Soth can only enter all sea, coastal, and river hexes. It can never cross all land hex side. It moves as a naval unit without attrition in areas where it can move. The sword from here. This sword is revealed. The leader who finds it must pick it up. He cannot transfer it to another leader or unit. It may only be transferred if the discovering leader is killed. In the friendly movement segment, the owning player must roll die for the leader with the Thaumir. If the roll is less than or equal to his unmodified hero rating, he may move normally. If it is greater, he is moved to Sauce Tax if he has been revealed, or to Magic X containing an unrevealed counter. If Soth is an ally enemy, the leader must engage in it in heroic combat in the friendly diplomacy resolution segment. Waiting to do so, he may not use magic, add anything to normal combat, and be affected by any combat result except to follow Soth if Soth is forced to retreat. If the leader kills Soth and the hex is occupied by enemy units, it rolls immediately to determine if he is killed by those units. If Soth is the only player's ally, the leader of Femir must still attack as above. If Soth kills him, it becomes neutral. Both sides may attempt to ally with it in future diplomacy resolution segments. If Soth is neither player's ally, the leader with Femir must engage it in heroic combat in the next diplomacy resolution segment. If Soth has yet to be revealed, the leader moves to an unrevealed Magic Hex counter. If it is Soth, he attacks. If it is anything else, act as previously specified. At the start of each friendly movement segment, the owning player must roll. If the leader is killed in his quest for Soth, the Sword from Mirror stays in the hex where he died. If the hex is occupied by any leader, friend or foe, he must pick up the sword and continue the quest. If all units are present, it stays in the hex until the leader enters it. If Soth lives, leaders must pick up the sword. If he is dead, picking it up is optional. Mercenaries, there are six groups of mercenaries. Lord Matoy, Costa Kos, Sar, Fernand Cover, the Hounds, and Silver Fragurel. Each group consists of a leader with one or more combat units, except for Silver Fragurel, who has no units. Diplomacy with mercenaries. Mercenary leaders and units begin in the mercenary holding box. To a movement segment of his player turn, the phasing player may move any of his leaders to this box. He may be returned to the game map in the player's next movement segment. In the phasing player's diplomacy phase, each mercenary leader in the mercenary holding box can conduct diplomacy with a mercenary leader. Diplomacy is conducted specified for neutral kingdoms using the term die roll modifier, two dice, etc. If the net result is 10 or higher, the mercenaries come under control of the phasing player. When a mercenary group comes under player, player's control, he immediately places its leader and units in any city hex under his control. When a player recruits a mercenary group, he must assign control them to one of his kingdoms or the necro to one of the, his kingdoms or the necromancer. Hexes controlled by the mercenary units are considered to be controlled by their assigned controller, raising mercenaries. The remaining mercenaries units are placed in the controlling player's recruitment pool. The cost to recruit them must be paid by one of the controlling player's kingdoms. They may only be recruited if their leader is still alive, is occupying a city hex during the recruitment phase. They are placed to that leader when they are recruited. In all other cases, obey the normal rules of recruitment. Units belonging to a dead leader may not be recruited unless he is raised from the dead. Cost to cost, cost to cost, and the sons of the morning are immune to all forms of magic. No magic of any kind can affect them. <clears throat> Victory conditions. If the Necromancer is permanently killed, the King's player wins a decisive victory. If Sela Haroslor is conquered by the Necromancer, the Necromancer player wins a decisive victory. 
If neither condition above occurs, players determine the winner after 14 game terms have been completed. To do so, calculate the total production value of hexes controlled by the Necromancer. By the Necromancer alone, excluding areas controlled by his allies. When this is done, consult the table below to determine who won. Total production, 0 50. Decisive kingdoms, victory. 51 80. Substantive kingdoms. 81 115. Marginal kingdoms, victory. 116 135. Draw. 136 160. Marginal necromancer. 161 to 190. Substantive necromancer. 191 plus not. Decisive necromancer victory. And then on the back is the player aids of the terrain effects chart, attrition table, combat results table, diplomacy table, Kellan Orient election table, hero combat table, and recruitment table. <coughs> so here's everything all set up. First of all, you put the battlefield markers on the, the hex indicator. Then the magic hex units, you put them where there's a, a pentacle across the board. Off to Hiernan, place one infantry unit in each of the five cities and one naval unit in each of the two ports. Place additional infantry unit in Silfren and CLR. Place an armament in the forges. Furley, place one infantry and one naval unit in each of the four cities. Place Furlor in Farmost. Kelleran Orit. Place one infantry unit in each of the three cities and one naval unit in each of the two ports. Place Zala de Fore, Pottery, and Touch of Liberty in Keep Kalar, the capital. Place Gubnud in Farbrigar. Lamarak. Place two cavalry units and Lod Lodalum in Zelmak, the capital. Place one cavalry unit in the other city. Lomarok. Place one infantry unit in each of the three cities. Place cavalry unit. Passage in the Sword and Lassalam in Fort Marek, the capital. The Scythe. Place one rock rider unit in each of the three cities. Place an additional rock rider unit. Skedor and Scythe in Sun Weston, the capital here. Starkeep. Place one infantry and one naval unit in each of the two cities. Put Keeper and the Keeper Scepter in Star's End. Capital. Stavor. Place one infantry unit in each of the seven cities and a naval unit in each of the six ports. Put three infantry units, one cavalry unit, a siege train, and the staff winners in a Stavfarin leader box. And then place Stavfarin in Stav the Capital. And so these leader boxes, you use them to put the the units going with them. So, Tablator, place a two strength infantry unit, one naval unit, and siege train, and Stomeran leader box. Again, we'll keep track of them over there. Place Stomeran in the confluence capital. Place King's Guard unit, one strength infantry in each of the four cities. Place naval unit in Plutarch. Then the kind of old emperor, Zolo Horoslar, we're here. Place one strength infantry unit in each of the ten cities. Put an alien in each of the six ports. Place Nakan 5 in Sundrali, Sundralar, the capital. Place the Imperial Heavy Horse, Siege Train for Imperial Legion, Staff Empire, Give her White Hand, and Farnan in the Nakan 5 litter box. Then mercenaries put all the mercenary units over in the holding boxes. Then the necromancer will start with Padrak Darshoim, Talmorn, Mazal, and ten greater vampire units in Siege Train. Choose one hex on the game map and enters his starting units in that hex, ignoring stack information. None of these units pay attrition for this hex and is not counting as their first turn movement. They're basically coming in through a gate from the Realm of the Dead. Miscellaneous units, and I'll have him starting right over here. And I have them putting the necro Necromancer box, but he's, he'll be coming in here and kind of working his way across. Miscellaneous units, game turn markers placed in the first box of the game turn track. All the vampire units and the remaining kingdom units are part of the recruitment pool of the Necromancer or the owning kingdom, respectively. And then we'll start to play. 
start a game turn two here. So what's happened so far, the Necromancer's come in. He's uh, got some greater vampire units under his three different leaders. Mazal, Termarin, and Pedric Delsham. Actually, Pedric Delsham's forces were able to get into Sierra Lor and took that city. And, uh, of course, the Awe, Sirenan were activated then, but he had to, in the battle, the leader here had to retreat. Ostrom were, uh, they both lost some forces. The In the battle, the Necromancer lost a couple of greater vampires. Ahasiren lost a couple of infantry. Subsequently, the Ahasiren has recruited three infantry back during their recruitment taxation phase. And uh, now we'll start at turn two. And I'll kind of zoom in on what's going on over here. So the Necromancer goes first. And then first he does the Vampire Recruitment segment. Do that, you figure out the effective taxation area. And so that's, uh, you look at that zone of control around there. He's got the city, which is two, because that's indicated there. Two gold per river hex and one for settled. So when you look at this area around here, and then also the ones surrounding here, it turns out to be a total of 13. In his recruitment pool, he, he currently has all the lesser vampires. So you take that number 13 divided by five, which you know it's uh, approximately three. And if he has less than that number, he can recruit some basically and He's got more armies in the field than that right now, so we can't recruit any. And that's the kingdom taxation segment. If, if he has any allied kingdom, and he doesn't, so he doesn't collect taxes from them. King recruitment, if he has any allied kingdoms, he doesn't, so he doesn't recruit any from them. And then movement phase. First, the magic segment, where the necromancer leaders can cast spells affecting movement. So the type of magic spells they can do is dictated by the rune they have. Zor has the rune of terror, and the spells he can do for that are fear or intimidation, and e neither of those are movement spells. And Telmorn and Padrek both have the, the death rune, and the spells they can cast are kill or raise undead. And neither of those are movement spells, so they don't do it in that phase. The movement's kind of neat. You keep track of your attrition over the different terrain. So he's going to be moving up here to go after this city. So he's going attrition. Their vampires fly, so their so their air units across settled is one. So one, two, three, and then the attrition table. You look at the total attrition point in your roll. Got a two, so he didn't have any attrition. He didn't lose any units. He's going to be moving his forces down here to combat the leader, but he'll leave one in there. Vampires can't cross the river hex, so they're just going to stay on that side of the river. And they'll stay in that hex. So that was one attrition point. And they rolled a six, so they got pretty unlucky there. They actually lost one unit due to attrition, even though they just moved one spot. So they lose a greater vampire unit. And then these units are gonna vampires can fly. They can't fly across rivers, but they can fly across still sea. They'll fly across and enter Starkeep here on the island to I might mention there's also a stacking limit, which is listed here. So you have a limit of four units on settled, two on mountain, etc. This is a settled hex here, so they're going to fly the leader and these three vampires over here. And air is two across mountains, and then it's just one across. So two, three, four, five, six. They'll see if they have any attrition. Nope, no attrition. 
in uh, they do combat, they do their magic. So Mazal has the Rune of Terror and his combat spell is Fear. So now if he rolls his magic value or less, he's successful. He's not successful. If he would have been successful, an enemy that would have had to retreat. And Talmorn has the the death rune. And he's going to be... So his magic is two. Got a, a one, so he's successful. And so his combat is kill. So when I name the leader in the cast of Texas Tardigan, he is eliminated unless his player makes a successful roll against his hero rating or magic strength, whichever is higher. If the roll is less or equal to the higher value, the leader lives. If not, he's dead. So here's the leader. He's actually the keeper, so. And his highest here in magic, they're both three. And he, he saved, basically, so he's okay. And also, Podrick is going to be doing a spell. Again, it's the kill spell. He's not successful. Okay, well, here's the combat. They got a lot going on here. We got a couple leaders, and we have a magic weapon as well here. And there's land units and infantry, and also air. And land, air, and infantry can all attack each other. First of all, you put the combat strengths, and it's three plus three or six for the the Necromancer's troops for Talmoron's troops, and it's it's two plus three or five for the the Starkeep troops. So you take the ratio of that, and it's you know close to one. Subtract one from that number, so now it's zero. If the so if the attacker is stronger, add the number to turn them up to the roll, but it's plus zero, so. So let's first roll the dice. Get a five. So then the modifier to that is you add the there's just a plus zero modifier for the strength differences. And then we do the hero ratings and there's a so it's a plus three for tall more. But then it's a minus three for the keeper, so we're back down to five. And then you see if there's any hero modifiers for the magic weapons, and there's not. There's a magic modifier, but there's not a hero modifier. So we're at five, and then we see what the result is. And the result of five, the attacker loses one unit, and the defender has loses one and retreats. They don't want to lose their boat, so... And they, they retreat. You know, they control that town. And then similarly, battles happened here and here. Here they were able to make them retreat, so they gained some more territory. And here they actually were able to move in and gain a city. They each lost a unit, but the other side had to retreat. And then there's diplomacy, but the necromancer isn't going to move forces to another kingdom's capital to do that. So now we'll go into the kingdom's phase. And the kingdom's taxation and recruitment. They've, uh, so in Starkeep here, they lost control of the city, and they initially had a value of 16, so they have to deduct that, and then they also have to deduct the areas they lost adjacent to that. It's actually 3 there, so 12 minus, so 16 minus 4, which isn't, and there's only control center down to 12. And with that, for recruitment, they're limited by what counters they have. In this recruitment table, so infantry costs 10. They'll get an infantry and they have to put it in a city. So they'll put it here. The Odd Serum, 
they have a total of 40 because they lost the value of some cities. They still have land though. They were at 56, but they, the amount they lost gets them down to 40. So they could get four infantry, but unfortunately they only have, well, they, they only have three in the pool, so that's the maximum amount they get back. And they have to, again, put those in cities. Put one over here as well. So the Kingdom player is going to move then. And since Starkeep is activated, they're going to move one of their infantry over here to support them. So, and the attrition cost for infantry across settled is two. So, two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve. So, I'll make a attrition roll. One. They're fine. It's a couple other movements he'll do. He'll move his leader so front here with a uh, infantry over to this magic hex. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. So it's a little bit risky. Look at the attrition table. Two. So he did lose his army, fortunately, but the leader's still there. And the, the keeper is going to go get ready to do diplomacy. So he's going to go to the mercenary box to cost el cost. And the reason he's going to go there is, is a diplomacy table that shows you know, which ones are more favorable. And you know, if you look at the kingdoms. Cost del cost gives a plus four, so he's more likely to ally with him. And then we'll do the diplomacy roll to see if uh, cost del cost joins him. So nine plus four is thirteen. You need a ten or higher for an alliance, and so I'll cost del cost is an alliance. So he'll appear at their city here. And then over here now, he gets to discover what this item is. This magic hex. And it turns out, Sophron just came across the sword Famir, which is here. So now, when he gets that, he must pick it up. Can't be transferred until he's killed. So the movement segment must roll a die. If the roll is less than or equal to modif unmodified hero, he has moved to this, the monster sauce hex. If he's revealed, if he's yet to be revealed, he moves on a, to an unrevealed magic hex counter. Starting he's trembling the movement, he must roll. So he's on a quest for sauce. So like that gives you a little sense of the play. So that's the Dark Emperor from Avalon Hill from 1985. Very much enjoyed it. It reminded me a little bit of a Yakinto game. Um, Beast Lord that I looked at a while back. Not exactly the same, but some similarities. Fantasy, you know, warfare on a on a board. Um, a lot of great elements to it. It's got it's got magic, um, combat of different types of elements. Nice background. A lot of different variations and the different uh, asymmetry of the different cultures because of the different combat strengths of their units and different magic they start with. You get to you get to do some discovery with magic items and monsters. Um, kind of good versus evil thing. You can do diplomacy, you do production. It's really got a lot going for it. And as always Avalon Hill has got really high quality of their components and boards. So I appreciate that. I highly recommend it. I think, I think I'll give that an 8 out of 10. Uh, thanks a lot.